Hi, this is David Beckmeyer with a brief message before we dive into today's episode. Recent events have left many people feeling angry, betrayed, and desperate for immediate action. Supreme Court rulings and the turmoil of the debate have created a perfect storm of frustration and fear. It's understandable to feel this way. When the very foundations of our republic seem to be at risk, our instincts drive us to stand up, shout out, and demand change. We have to acknowledge the depth of fear and concern that many are feeling right now. The desire for immediate, decisive action is strong, and rightly so. However, if we fall into the trap of viewing those on the other side as enemies rather than fellow citizens, we risk deepening the divide and perpetuating the cycle of outrage that got us here in the first place. Yes, it might seem counterintuitive or even infuriating to suggest that we need to listen to those we see as opposing our fundamental values. Yet, this is precisely the time when such conversations are most vital. It'd be easy for this podcast to get swept up in the outrage cycle. And let's be honest, many shows have gone this cheap route, luring listeners in with constant stream of outrage fuel. But we believe this is exactly the moment we need to be strong. Even if it means going against the grain, even if some listeners might crave the firestorm, we're committed to thoughtful discussion and nuanced perspectives. We're sticking to our guiding principles. We ask you to bear with us. It's not about diluting our principles or ignoring the critical issues at hand. It's about building a stronger, more resilient democracy through understanding and mutual respect. So let's dive in and see how we can stay anchored in reason and pursue impactful responses, even when it seems like the last thing anyone wants to do. Thanks for staying with us. Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is a bonus episode about crossing party lines. depends on the context it depends on the relationship it depends on the subject matter some subjects are are just too triggering for us we need to do some self work before we can get there some relationships are too valuable to us where we step in fearful let's face it political conversations these days often go in circles sometimes you barely get a word in before things escalate and by the end everyone's more frustrated than when they started we all want to be heard and to understand where others are coming from But with so much anger and division, it's getting harder and harder to have productive conversations across the political spectrum. And that's where our guest today comes in. I started Crossing Party Lines back in 2016 because of my relationship with my cousin, whose whose votes canceled out mine. And um, also noticing how many friends and family members were starting to cut ties with people they knew simply because of politics. And, and I just felt that was wrong. And I kept telling them, no, I refuse to accept that half of America is my enemy. And I wanted to do something about it. That's Lisa Swallow, founder of Crossing Party Lines. Crossing Party Lines has created a space where people with opposing views can actually talk to each other and maybe even learn something new. So Crossing Party Lines is a nonprofit. We're national. Um, We teach people the skills and concepts that they need to know in order to be confident that they can talk to their political other, whoever that might be. And we create opportunities for them to practice those skills in real life conversations, um, weekly, um, virtually, and with people from all over the country, sometimes all over the world. Now, Lisa will be the first to tell you they don't have all the answers. No one does when it comes to navigating these tricky conversations. But in my experience, she gets it right as close to all the time as anyone, bringing a unique approach that fosters genuine understanding and respect, even in the face of strong disagreement. So if you're tired of the yelling matches and want to see how conversations across the political divide can happen, then you don't want to miss this interview. Stick around as we chat with Lisa Swallow, 
about how to bridge the political divide one conversation at a time. Because I talk to so, so many experts and, and, and others on the show that some, some people think I'm some kind of an expert in, in, deal, in having conversations like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not. I struggle with it just like everybody else does. So I, I, and I have, you know, sort of more scientists and sort of more of the academic side. They have some advice for this kind of thing, but they're not necessarily practitioners. So it's, I, really like, I, I really like the opportunity to speak to you about you've seen people get better at it, I guess, for, in simple terms, and uh, sort of deal with some of these problems, challenges that we all deal with. And um, so I, I guess one question I'll ask, and, and you can take this kind of wherever, um, when, I, when I think of how the crossing party lines model kind of works in this kind of controlled setting, um, do you think people can apply or is it dangerous maybe to apply this in not such a setting or can and can it work when it's not so sort of orchestrated like that? It can. Um, dangerous, maybe. It just depends on whether you're diving into the deep end when you're ready. So it depends on who you're talking to. Are they aligned with you? Have they decided they also want to have civil, respectful, and and informative conversations? Or are they unprepared for you to come in and say, hey, I want to talk differently. I want to, I want to really understand where you come from. Because if if they're not prepared for that, they may not be trusting you and they may not join you in this. So um, I actually have a workshop on how to bring this into real life. And it starts with understanding what the normal conversation with someone is like and helping them join you in this effort. And so I give some tips on how to do that. So um, making sure that everyone involved in the discussion has the same intention, setting some some ground rules to create a space that is, I don't like to call it safe because safe suggests that the speaker never say anything that might be problematic, but we call it a brave space where both sides are saying, hey, I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. We're gonna do our best. We're gonna muddle through this. It's never gonna be perfect. So setting the ground rules, setting the expectations is the first place to start. Once you have that, it only takes one person who knows the skills to kind of lead that conversation in the right way. Yeah, and that's one thing I was getting at there. I've had people sort of ask the meta question of sort of like, how do you even bring people to accept that idea of, of the brave space thing, to, to kind of come to the conversation in good faith? That can even be a challenge, in even getting people to that point. Well, it really just takes honesty and a little bit of vulnerability. So when you approach someone and say, you know, let's, let's say we're talking about my cousin, Dennis. If I go up to him and I say, Dennis, I understand what the left thinks because I'm pretty far left, but I really don't understand how you vote the way you do, What, how that makes sense to you. Would you mind helping me understand? That's a really honest, genuine question. And most people, if you have a reasonable relationship with them are going to say, oh, wow, thanks for asking. Yeah, I'd love to tell you why voting for Trump or um, whatever made sense to me. You just have to make sure they believe you. You've got to be really, really honest when you say that, don't have any ulterior motives. And that's that's so true, but that can it can still go sideways pretty fast. It is hard to do that honesty that you're talking about, but but yeah, let's step back and talk about some people. I think talk about how well this guy's got the wrong idea. My my idea of success is I want him to land here in this new position, and I I am not sure that's the right way to look at it. Or I'm pretty sure that's not the right way to look at it. So maybe we can talk a little bit about you can tell us a little bit about how that works. Like how do you even define success in this? Oh, I love that question because, as you say, a lot of us think success looks like I've changed their mind. I've convinced them to come to my side. That is not how we define success. So the vision behind Crossing Party Lines is a country that harnesses diversity of thought for a stronger nation. And we believe that the issues that we face as a country, all of them, are so complex, you can't really understand them from one perspective. So an opportunity to look at an issue from another perspective is exactly what we need in order to better understand politics. So our definition of success is that we were able to hear someone else's perspective, and it has nothing to do with them hearing ours. So if we go into a conversation expecting success to be, okay, I've listened to them, now they have to listen to me, and um, I don't really believe what they said, but when they hear what I have to say, it's going to make so much sense that they're going to change positions. Well, that's not 
a crossing party lines type experience. And that is actually um, a definition a definition of success that I really don't think is reasonable. I don't think anyone's going to be successful with that on a regular basis. Yeah, so say that again. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with them hearing my position. <laughs> I want to I make sure we all <laughs> really hear that. <laughs> right. Yeah, so tell us how you get there. Like, how do you, because that's often the first thing we want to do, right? Yeah. Um, let, do you mind if I take us on a little detour? Yeah, let's do it. I love to teach people how to share their views with other people. And what that means is not talking about the views so much as why the views make sense for you. So an example is when I think about global warming, I'm really concerned about my kids having a, a healthy environment to live in. And so I look, I, I look at that from the perspective of how rapidly is the environment changing? Is the temperature going up? And I get concerned about that. So now the person hearing that understands what I care about, why I care about it, and can ask me some interesting questions about it. In that process of figuring out how to share my views in a way that gets someone interested and curious, I start to understand my views a whole lot more. I understand, oh, wait, wait, my views are based on what I care about, what I'm afraid of, what I've been exposed to, you know, what I've been hearing and who I've been hearing it from, as well as often, you know, what are my um, primary moral foundations that I rely on? For instance, for me, it's caring and fairness, not so much respect for authority. Um, I come to understand my views a lot more. The better I understand my views, the stronger I am in them. I don't have to convince anyone of why my views are right for me. So now I'm entering the conversation going, oh, I'm happy to share my views and I'm ready to do so. But really, I want to understand yours. Why do yours make sense? And now and then I hear something that goes, oh, wow, that's something I hadn't thought of. I can change my views and still feel confident and strong in them. Um, so it's that attitude of humility, of curiosity, of I really want to understand the issues more than I want to be right, more than I want to convince them that I am right. I want to help them understand the issues. And if they're open to it, they can hear me. But I also know that the kinds of questions I want to ask to, to understand theirs might lead them to look at their views even from a different perspective. Yeah, and it seems like, I mean, what I notice in this is it's sort of, there's sort of a spectrum how likely you are to be triggered about it or or really dig in your heels. Like, I think some issues can be a lot easier to talk about than others when you're not quite as, as, as married to them. There's nothing that's going to change my mind. And, you know, this thing is so important to me that, nope, there's nobody, there's nothing that can change my mind. So I do see that. So I, I have a hard time. I mean, I kind of wonder when we when we get, get to the issues like that, it can be hard. Another thing maybe you can comment on is I see people say almost the reverse, right? I've talked to this person. I know I'm never going to be able to change their mind. So why should I talk to them? So I guess maybe those two things are roughly related in some way, because, you know, should I still talk to them if I if I and, and maybe I'm wrong that they're not never going to change their mind. But I've seen that, too. Or like, I'm not. Why should I talk to them? I'm never going to change their mind. Um, I. I, I, that question is a great one, and it's one that actually no longer makes sense to me in some ways, in that I have no desire to change anyone's mind anymore. I just have, right? I have a desire to understand my own views, and I have a desire to understand the issues. And if someone's mind's changed in the process, fine. I don't worry about one person's vote, whether it's mine or theirs that's probably not gonna make a difference. I care about helping all of us become more critical thinkers, understand the issues as deeply as possible and make the best choice. And I know that maybe mine isn't the best choice. Let's just see where it goes. So um, there's that. But the other thing is um, our limbic systems. Uh, included in the skills and concepts I teach for folks at Crossing Party Lines is uh, an understanding of how our limbic system works what throws us into fight or flight? And um, the answer is anything that has to do with politics throws us into fight <laughs> or flight. What happens when you're in fight or flight? Well, number one is you become defensive. You're defending your ideas. You're, you are defending your beliefs, your identity. Um, but the other thing that happens is the limbic system throws you into survival mode, which means it reroutes a lot of the oxygen away from your neocortex, which means you're not thinking straight. 
you effectively lose 10 to 15 IQ points and you're not showing up as your best self. So regardless of why you want to talk politics, I help people recognize if you can avoid fight or flight, you're going to be in a better position. You're going to show up as yourself. So that's why I teach skills for um, staying calm and cool and collected when you're in these conversations. Yeah, it's always easier said than done. Um, you know, and a lot of that comes back to what you were saying about this, trying to remember how to define success, right? That we're not, if we go into it, just hoping we're going to change everybody's mind, that's probably going to sort of set us up for failure. You know, and it's nice to be able to talk about that you know, I, I'm coming to the point where I really feel like we need some basic psychology as like a prerequisite for everybody. <laughs> um, because we, even if that's not our specialty or some kind of other kind of science geek or something, that stuff is at play. No matter how much you think you're being rational, that stuff is at play all the time. It is. It is definitely. And some people, when they're triggered, sound even more rational than normal. And that's because they draw upon lots of things they thought about deeply and they're able to present them in a really rational way. Um, but they're still triggered and you can tell that because they're not really hearing what you have to say. They're not really synthesizing new information. Um, they're, they're just not thinking critically. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I don't have 10 or 15 IQ points to spare. <laughs> no, no, very few of us do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, I guess... Um, you know, I, I, that's, and have you, I guess that, that brings me to something I, I, it's nice to talk about too, is like, you've been doing this for, for a while and I'm assuming you're, you're, you can see this, that people get better at this. You can see people become, you know, better at not being triggered and better at, at so these tools, you're finding these tools are working. Have, have they evolved over that time to sort of see, see improvements in that? Yeah, yeah. The tools have evolved a lot. When I first started, I thought the key was active listening. If if you could listen, you'd be fine. Um, then I learned that, well, you have to deal with why you can't listen, which is usually that you're triggered. So you have to learn to manage your limbic system. And then I learned that, well, politics and morality go hand in hand. So the more you can understand morality in a non-binary way, where it's not immoral versus moral, instead it's we're differently moral, the more you can open yourself up to hearing other people's positions, which to you look like they're immoral. And then suddenly you find, oh, no, 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 they're just making decisions based on different criteria than I am. So we've had this deep evolution. We've um, learned new ways to explore facts together, to find shared facts, new ways to look at science that really help us step away from that battle between my science and yours, or, or you're a science denier if you don't agree with mine. And um, I've started teaching people critical thinking because I've realized that as long as we think we are thinking critically and they are not, we're not really showing up as equals in a conversation. We're not respecting them. So um, let's learn what critical thinking really looks like, teach ourselves to do it because most of us actually are not doing it, even though we think we are. Yeah, when I, that's one of my hot button terms right there is that, you know, the way people use the term critical thinking. Um, and, and sort of the do your own research kind of stuff. And um, usually they aren't even close to what it would tr typically mean. So tell us, can you tell us a little bit, like give us the short version? Of what critical thinking is? Cri critical thinking, yeah. Okay, um, my short version is Karl Popper. And if you don't know Karl Popper, you can find some great YouTubes about him. Um, he basically helps us understand that if we're going to think cr critically, use real scientific method, we're going to look for information that disproves our theory and not focus just on proving that we're right. And this is why I say most people who go into political conversations are not thinking critically, because if they enter saying, I'm going to show you how I'm right, <laughs> um, I'm not even going to listen to what you have to say because you're wrong. That goes against everything that scientific method is about. That goes against everything Karl Popper teaches. Um, it's just kind of, it's it's a way to reinforce any bad thinking that you're doing and not open yourself up to a new approach to understanding the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if inquiry-based learning comes into it at all, if you're familiar with that term or, or that language and if that kind of applies to it as well. It does, it does. And um and, Another thing is, it's. I think it's crucial for people to start exploring their own biases. 
Um, the more we can understand the biases that are strongest in us, the more we can push against them and say, oh yeah, I know I tend to give into this particular bias and let me try not to. Um, and the more we can challenge our own thought process, like how easily are we susceptible to this belief that this is a slippery slope or how often do we accept false dichotomies? The more we understand these things, the more we can enter into the right conversation and the more questions we ask, all of those things are important for us to really be serious about learning anything, whether it's politics or anything else. Right. Well, and and the anything else can pretty quickly, you know, we're, we're really anxious to put everything in a red or blue bucket, even if it sort of doesn't seem like it was politics. Somehow we managed to make it politics pretty fast. So it starts triggering all that stuff. So, um, you know, I noticed these blind spots, like you were just saying, um, you know, try to be aware of your own biases. And, you know, and I notice in these, these interviews and really smart people, I mean, I've talked to a lot of really smart people that like, you know, it's a lot of that they're doing the thing that they're talking about right now and they don't realize they're doing it. Um, so, and, and I'm sure I do the same thing. So, you know, is there any, you have any quick advice or any, any maybe not even that quick advice about some ways we can kind of even appreciate our biases a little bit better? Because often we're just totally blind to it. Um, I'm actually working on a new book, which is called The Illogic of Politics. And what I'm doing is I'm pulling the top 30 or so biases and logical fallacies that, that we tend to be susceptible in politics. And of those, there's about 10 that are really, really important for us all to be able to identify. One is availability bias. Um, that the more you are exposed to something, the more you tend to believe it's true. There's confirmation bias. I'm always looking for things to confirm my belief and, and not to refute it. There's my side bias. If my guy says it, I'm more likely to believe it than if your guy says it. So there's a set of those. Um, getting comfortable with those few and being able to recognize is is really, really important. But as I said, it's also really hard to recognize it in ourselves. Yeah, I, I teach people to start with one or two and just play with it and watch it throughout the day. And once you get comfortable, you start noticing. You, you really do. Um, just don't bite off more than you can chew. One or two at a time. That's plenty. It's maybe, maybe there's an application for AI that we wouldn't um, feel like we're being threatened by somebody on the other side with the AI said, I think your, your confirmation bias is coming out right now. <laughs> because I mean, if somebody calls me out on it, I'm going to, and it depends on the trust relationship and everything, but you know, uh, cause I may not even see it. And like, you know, if someone calls me out on it, that's the right trust. I might go with it, but a lot of people, I'm just going to sort of dig my heels in probably and fight harder. Yeah. It probably depends on how they call you out. If they say, Oh, that's your confirmation bias. That's one thing. But if they say, you know, that makes sense. But I wonder how many different things have you looked at? You know, have you tried looking at what might disprove what you just shared with me? You know, a, just a curious question is less threatening than calling someone out. Yeah, right. For sure. Yeah. And that's uh, that's a good approach when you can. Yeah, it's it's like social media sort of encourages you to do the former. Right. You just do these dumb things and you think like what just happened? Nothing. How, how is that going to you know improve the situation at all? But but we all sort of sometimes fall into it and do it. But, you know, it seems like it's the worst plot, the worst sort of the whole atmosphere of it, the whole environment of it. It's just sort of fosters all the worst behaviors in us. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like. It's not made for conversation. It's made for getting people to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down to divide us into my side or your side. So it's doing its job. It's just we forget that that's what its job is. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, when people that decide to take to, to work with your courses, you know, they're already sort of self-selecting that they want want to in, come to this in good faith. We talked in the beginning about this idea of having a conversation in the wild. That person didn't elect you know, to, to to join into that, so I, I guess we're we're a little bit limited there. If, if, are you finding? I mean, maybe this is a bad question, but are you finding a left or right bias in like your groups? I mean, is is one side sort of coming to the table more than the other? I would I would sort of assume not. I, I would just figure we're all sort of the same in this. Um. I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to say yes. We see that more left-leaning folks participate. Um, but what we've been seeing is when we have in-person meetings and um, people who are right-leaning or libertarian show up, after the first experience of really being listened to, they come back. 
So a number of conservatives have shared with me that they had they had leaned into some experiences that they thought would be like crossing party lines, only to discover that those were really disguised attempts to convert them. And so there's a, they, they have to come and experience it in order to fully embrace it. We're not getting in front of as many conservatives as we would like. So it's often word of mouth or um, they happen upon it. And, and then they show up and then it's up to us to give them an experience that helps them trust that we really are about listening to them, not trying to convert them. Yeah, and I, that, that's great to hear. And I, 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 I feel the same way on this show. I, I know, you know, kind of talking to academics and that kind of stuff. And so it, 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 it leans left a little, but I'm pretty proud that something like 40 percent of my, my listeners sort of lean right. So it's good to have. Uh, you know, that's good to be able to have some representation there that I'm because it is easy for people to people often feel like they're they've got to pick a side. Mm -hmm. And is this is are these people on my side or not my side? So it's nice to be able to have uh, a space that people feel like I don't know if they're on my side for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Or, you know, it's clear that that we're we're enough balance here that I I can live with it. And, you know, something you were talking about in the beginning got me thinking a little bit about with some of these things, we sort of go into it expecting to change the other person, but we end up changing ourselves. And do you sort of see that in, in the folks that come in? Because I see that in myself just doing this podcast. Yeah. People typically come, the first thing they learn is that, oh my goodness, those other people are not insane. And they start building this rapport with them, starting to like them. So that's a change. The next thing is they're going, wow, I think I understand the issues a lot more now. And then a change that I see happening a lot is people start defining themselves not simply as I'm left, right, Democrat, Republican, but defining themselves as I'm someone who cares more about understanding the issues than about being right. And I am someone who's curious about other people's views. And that reframing of who they are, I think, is the most important change and one that I hope everyone will eventually get to if they keep coming to crossing party lines. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's great because that's, that's, that I think is a big step in all this. I mean, I, you know, if you look at a lot of the data on, you know, how we can lower the temperature, a big piece of it is lowering those perceptions that those misguided perceptions that we have. Oh yeah. And we see most people who come to crossing party lines start saying they don't like the two party system. And a lot of them say they're going to invest their time in alternative voting methods that are less likely to encourage a two-party system because they want to allow more people a chance to feel represented and that most of us don't feel that we fit into either of those buckets. Yeah, yeah. And I think electoral reforms are really gaining a lot of traction. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for something to happen there. Yeah. So um, tell us where should someone start? Like wh- where, where should, how does, and, and how, how much of a commitment d- does someone have to make to get, to get involved in this? Um, if you just want to get involved in crossing party lines, you can find us on meetup, just search for crossing party lines and find some event that looks interesting and join it and just have that experience of being in a moderated. So we, every one of our conversations has a trained facilitator kind of guiding people in the more appropriate ways to talk. Um, Have that experience. You'll also see workshops when we're about to have them. They'll pop up on your meetup feed and say, oh, I want to take this one. It doesn't take a big investment in time or or energy. Um, I also encourage people to get my book. I have a workbook that teaches the first four workshops. We have multiple modules to help you understand what's involved in talking across differences, what are the basic skills, what gets in the way of us having success. And if you go through that workbook, you're going to find um, you are learning those skills, you are um, preparing yourself, and you can do it in your own time, a um, little at a time, read it all at once, whatever. Um, I think the main thing is you have to want to do it. You have to accept that, hey, there's more to an issue than I can understand just looking through my own perspective. And hey, anyone whose views are different than mine probably have something I can learn from. Um, Let me just lean into learning how to listen. Great. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think and I I think that's that's sincere. I think there is a good percentage of people out there that do are sincere about trying to lower the temperature. And I think that that that's a for, for a real thing. Um, I'm kind of counting on it. That's what my podcast is <laughs> is talking to. But uh, yeah, so the workbook's online, so we can put a link in in the show notes for that. Yeah, it's at Amazon. 
And it's called Yes, You Can Talk Politics. Okay, great. All right. Well, um, I think that's great. I, I mean, I, I really I hope I, I'm really encouraged that you've got so much happening there. And I really hope that some of my listeners kind of jump on, on board with this. I, I think it's something that a lot of them could could really benefit from. Great. Thank you. Any uh, any final thoughts for us that I forgot to cover? Uh, this is a topic that I could go on for hours and hours <laughs> about. I, I think it all starts with deciding who you are and recognizing that the traditional way of doing politics is more about being right than being informed or being curious. And if you make a commitment to, I want to be informed, I want to be curious, um, then it's going to happen. So that starts with who am I as a person and what's my relationship to politics and to the rest of America. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. If you enjoyed this episode, if you found it interesting, please tell some friends about it. Uh, Post it to your social media. Better yet, text someone. Even better, talk to someone in real life. Tell them about this show. I really appreciate it. Okay, see you in a week or two. We'll be right back.